Welcome to the Content Machine Podcast. We are listening to the second part of our interview with Scott Williams today. If you haven't heard the, the first half, go back in your podcast feed and listen to the first half. So this is a, you know, we do a lot of marketing here and that's the main focus of this channel. But so what, when you think about your general philosophy of marketing for a museum, which you've had the opportunity to be involved in at a couple different locations now, what is that? How do you, you know, when, you know, if you had students coming to me like, how do we sell a museum? Where, where are you going to start? Yeah, you know what? I mean, it's really no different than selling anything else. Um, you you have to have, and you have to have everybody who's working on the project and or the product know who is the target audience, number one. Um, what is your objective? What strategies are you going to use? And then what tactics are you going to agree to use? And then how are you going to measure those so you can evaluate through, through, through time? Um, you know, you and I have both been associated with organizations or with individual campaigns where it's just all over the place, where you start off maybe, everybody starts off, but it's so easy to veer off target and end up just checking off boxes and doing things, posting on Facebook because you're supposed to, tweeting, you know, just, but it, are you measuring the, the effectiveness of that? Um, now more than ever, we can't afford to have people just randomly out there flailing, posting things. We got to be targeted um, on all the things that we do during the day. Is this contributing to the plan we've agreed on? Now you got to be flexible and be willing to change the plan, mm -hmm. but verbally change the plan or in writing change the plan. You know, you it's it's that's probably the biggest challenge um, for me, especially. You know, if you throw a stick. I am excited to go chase it for you. Yeah. You know, and I get that constantly. You know, people will throw sticks and say, oh, look, here's another fun, shiny, pretty stick. You know, and so I have to really watch myself and keep myself reeled in because I'm leading a whole team. Mm -hmm. So it's easy for me to say, hey, everybody, let's all go get the stick. Now, a lot of my direct reports will tell you that I still struggle with that very mightily. <laughs> you know, so anyways, it's, it's uh, pretty much, it's just like, the different the other the other aspect of this that's probably different than other projects is that or other products is that you know we have to be very much aligned in tourism with our state tourism departments if there's a local convention and visitors bureau you know it's very smart to take advantage of every opportunity to partner with those folks who are also um, trying to do the same thing you're trying to do, but oftentimes with bigger budgets, you know, they're, they're trying to get visitors into the state or into the city. And so it's really important to support them, you know, buy the ads if they need you to do whatever you got to do to support them, um, and help them be successful at what they're doing. Cause it'll just, it'll just pay off for you. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's like a 50,000 foot kind of view. What do you, what, what do you specifically do to get people in the door at discovery park? What has worked for you guys? Um, you know, I think the challenge of Discovery Park is um, the value proposition is a little different for everybody. So it's making sure that people understand the value proposition. Um, I ha we had an incident Friday night where somebody was here. I happened to be here for an event that we were having here, but somebody just came into the front door um, and she said, we're staying at the hotel next door. What is this place? And so I was able to explain it. She was from Chicago, and her and her mom and dad were here uh, for UT Martin's graduation. And so I thought, well, this is an interesting experience. You know, I need to be able to do this exact thing on a broad scale every day. And so um, seeing, you know, who she was, and, and I kind of gauged, you know, where are you from, and found out who, who she was, where she was from, about, you know, figured out about how old she was, and I was able to tell her about how much fun Discovery Park is, and focus on some of the areas. She was interested in history, so I was able to say, here's some of the things that we have here, you know, so we really have to be able to be very flexible in how we present Discovery Park because, you know, like you are going to want to bring your kids here because you want to give them an incredible experience um, that will help further their education and help further their um, impression of the world, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but if you and your wife were in your 
you know, mid sixties and your kids have moved away, you want a different experience. You know, you, you want to know that you can come here and it's not a children's museum. So we have to be very careful that we don't overemphasize some of the young, uh, some of the things we have for younger people. Mm -hmm. We want you to be able to come here. And then by the time you get in your eighties, you might not want to have to walk around a lot. So you want to know that there's enough in just the building and we wouldn't focus on the 50 acres you know, to, to, to you, we want to focus just on the building. Uh, with teachers, you know, we uh, promote the fact, well, first of all, there's the Kirkland Scholarship Fund. So if you're a teacher and you want to bring your class here, but you know you can't afford it, your school can't afford field trips, Discovery Park of America um, pays the tickets of schools who 50% or more are on the free or reduced lunch program. So, um, you, you know, you would probably fall into that category if you were worried about expenses. And so we would promote that. First of all, it's free. Um, and second of all, it's legitimately changing lives, you know. Mm -hmm. And so we would make sure you understand that as a teacher who cares about these students, bringing them here could literally put them on a different course. Um, and we have lots of research at this point that we share of students who have written us back and said, you know, hey, that Discovery Park changed my life and here's how. Um, and so each of those different target audiences, you know, we, we know what the value proposition is, what they're looking for, what are the hot points, and we make sure we focus on that um, when we promote. One size does not fit all. Mm -hmm. And then same thing with our development. Uh, initiative. So we have to raise money. You know, as a 501c3 nonprofit, uh, we do make money off of ticket sales and um, restaurant sales and merchandise. And but that only covers about half of our expenses. And so mm -hmm. we have to fundraise. Um, and so you, um, as a person who's a, um, a philanthropist uh, who's looking for uh, places where you might want to support. You know, if you're a, if you're from California, you're probably not super passionate about supporting uh, West Tennessee, Kentucky, but there are a lot of philanthropists who are. And so we try to get in front of them and show them, look, we're making a huge difference. Mm -hmm. If you join us and come alongside us, we can make an even bigger difference. Mm -hmm. So we have people who love to support educational facilities and they come to us and say, here's what I'm passionate about. Here's what I want to try to do at your facility. And we work with them to develop a program where their funds can also be applied to, to do things like, like what we do here. That multifaceted approach, is that a lot different to, than maybe the museum or Graceland or is it, is it the nature of the discovery park that it is so diverse that it, it's a different animal? It's very similar to the museum. Um, but it's very different than Graceland because Graceland was not a 501c3 nonprofit. Mm -hmm. So the difference between working for a nonprofit museum and a for-profit museum is in a for-profit museum, if it, doesn't work on the Excel spreadsheet, you probably aren't going to keep doing it. You yeah. know, you need to pay, you need to make a profit. You need to pay for things and then make a profit. In the nonprofit world, things of course need to return on the investment, but oftentimes at a deficit. And that's okay because people want to fund, um, people want to fund initiatives. And for example, our, our exhibit on innovation in agriculture, it would not be as fantastic as it is without the contribution of our partners like uh, Simmons Bank, Nutrient Ag Solutions. You know, there's a lot of folks that contributed. Same thing with our waterfowl exhibit. We have many, many financial supporters who are, because they're giving us the money, we're able to do this incredible exhibit. We would do an exhibit. But it would not be as as mind blowing as this one's going to be, yeah. and so that's very it's very different model um, between the two. What are some of the challenges? You know, I, I, I particularly think about the rural nature of Union City. You know, what how, how does that affect what the, what the Discovery Park's doing? Yeah, I mean, obviously, a town of ten thousand is not going to support a hundred thousand square foot museum on a 50 acre heritage park. So it's really crucial. A lot of museums will look at their community, their town. If we were in Chicago, we would be looking at Chicago as the community we serve. Mm -hmm. For us, the community we serve has to be much, much broader. So, you know, we're serving Nashville, Memphis, Jackson, Paducah, in some cases, St. Louis and even Louisville, you know, so our yard, our backyard is, mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. is much bigger and much broader. So we have to really focus much differently um, on those areas. Um, and then I would say probably our number one biggest challenge is um, we don't have a gigantic employment pool to draw from mm-hmm. in the first place. And then when you're in an, in an era like we're in now, um, where everybody's struggling, you know, to fill positions, you know, we struggle even more. So filling positions, I think, is, is one of our big challenges. Now, we're very, very fortunate that we have UT Martin, right? It's 20 minutes away, and we really position ourselves, and, and it is true that we are sort of a place where people who are either students or, or just graduated can sort of see what work is like. And so my direct reports and myself, we really try to make this be a place where young people can see what work is like, where, the, where we can model good leadership and we can model uh, how, what they can expect. Uh, I, I give a little speech at every one of our um, orientations where I say, look, if you're a young person and this is your first job, it is sometimes difficult to know what is normal because you don't have a bar. And so we work really hard to set that bar high and teach young people this is what's acceptable, this is what's not acceptable. You know, and we say, if, you've, if, you, if you don't know, ask us. You know, if you want to ask me or you want to ask our HR director or you want to ask your manager, that made me feel uncomfortable. Is that normal? Is that, you know, what? And also there are situations where, you know, I will, I or one of the managers will ask somebody to do something and the person pushes back a little bit. Like they didn't know they were going to, you know, they didn't understand the difference between college and work, you know, and, and they don't understand the difference between us as, as professionals and hopefully mentors and professors. You know, we're not professors. We're, we're wanting engagement. We're wanting them to give us their opinion to, you know, we're wanting them to almost be peers and to approach it that way. So, um, so while it's challenging trying to find positions, uh, trying to find people to fill positions, it's also created a great opportunity for us to really be almost like college 2.0 um, for a lot of people. And then also we have some incredible retirees who say, you know what, I, I, I have worked. Now I just want a place to come every day and be fulfilled. And, and so we have a lot of retirees who come and work here and they love working with the young people. So um, it's created a, 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 an opportunity you know, where, there, where there's also a bit of a challenge. How is more abundant web experiences like YouTube and VR gonna affect muse- museums in the future, you think? You know, so of course, I am curious, you know, with with um, AI and and uh, how the, how all that all of the technology, you know, for us in the museum business, you know, I think we're going to look at how technology can help us solve problems, which is how can we better tell stories or communicate information. You know, I was just looking at uh, just a few minutes ago before I got on the on this um, phone with you, I was looking at. Um, a technological experience that one of the museum companies is offering for rent or for sale. Um, and while it looked compelling and it looked interesting, it could, uh, it's only something that could be done one at a time. And so, you know, it was one piece of equipment and one individual could do it. But I thought, you know, that's not going to solve any, that's just going to create problems for us because the museum business is always feast or famine. You'll have 600 people one day and 60 people the next day and six the next. So we have to be able to accommodate any of those. And I'm afraid too many people would be extremely disappointed if they came and stood in line and did, never got a chance you yeah. know, to actually do the thing. And then they spend all their time here. So technology and um, um, both online and in person, you know, it's just another tool. Um, there's a tendency for me to want to be in every single thing all at once and to do everything and to be great at everything um, as an organization. But I do think, you know, we're entering an era where I think I would rather be good, really great at less. And so maybe not be everywhere. And so I don't know exactly yet which, which areas we might shave off. Um, but in some cases, we're just going through the motions, and that's what I think we want to shave that off, and we want to be really 
Excellent. We have a great opportunity because I've got a building full of people who are experts in a variety of sectors. And so whether it's biology or history or I've got people that are passionate and they love to talk about those things. So mm -hmm. um, I have I have content that no one else has. And so it's how do we best use that that then results in somebody buying a ticket to Discovery Park of America. At the end of the day, that is my objective, yeah. is to get people through that turnstile. Now, if I inspire children and adults to see beyond online and they never have to visit Discovery Park, that's great. But I really need to get them through that turnstile. Yeah, for sure. Well, speaking of content, you know, the Real Foot Forward podcast is a podcast that you guys produce there at the Discovery Park. Can you talk about the what and the why behind that? Yeah, sure. So, um, <clears throat> you know, as we mentioned, Discovery Park is in a town of um, town of 10,000. And so our backyard was very small. Um, we saw Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast, as an opportunity to broaden that, to get people in Jackson, Memphis, uh, uh, not quite as far as, as uh, Nashville, but, you know, we focus, we stay focused on West Tennessee. Um, there's pe there are people out there that are doing incredible things um, that align up with our mission to inspire children and adults to see beyond. So it was an opportunity to get those individuals spend a little bit of time, get to know them, have our listeners get to know them. And we're getting, you know, in the neighborhood of 3,000 listeners uh, to each podcast, which, you know, is, is solid for us. I'd love it if it was 30,000, but, yeah. you know, I'm happy with that. Um, it also uh, helps introduce us to people that don't know about Discovery Park. And I still get that. People from Memphis or Nashville or Jackson, I still get, now what? Now, who are you? Now, what are you? Are you a water park? You know, there are still people who don't get what we're about. But if I if I invite you to be on our podcast, which I did, you're going to, first of all, even if it's at the last minute, you're going to Google it real quick and make sure you understand. Now, what? Now what am, who am I going to be with here? Um, you're going to make sure you know who we are. And then once you've been on the podcast and had a positive experience and you've listened to it and you made sure it sounds good, you're going to then share it on social media. You're going to let all your friends know about it. And then that way we can take advantage of your social network mm -hmm. and, and, and just get it one more circle out um, in circulation. Now, the hardest thing, as you know, is to stay consistent. Um, it is so easy to run out of guests and be too focused on other things to get some more in the can. Mm -hmm. So we really have had to make sure it's a priority. Um, a while back we said, well, let's just do it every other week. Um, and we did that. And then we said, no, 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 no. Let's yeah. get recommit. Let's do it every week. Um, and, um, you know, it's, 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 it's given us a return on the investment, um, of my time and of our financial resources to put it together. And, um, once we get it down, it's easy to produce and it um, and it uh, it's fun to listen to. And and I've had a lot of people who have said to me, um, I listen every week. I love the guests you have. And so, you know, I think it's it's because sometimes I'm in the middle of one and I'm like thinking, is anybody going to think this is interesting? I hope so. Yeah. You know, I will. Yeah. You know, I think everything's interesting. And so, you know, I think, oh, my gosh, I hope people are I hope people are into this, you know. And and so far they always seem to be and we seem to have a good good listenership. And we have a lot of people who email us and and ask questions about the guests or whatever. So so it's it's kind of become a little promotional tool. Mm -hmm. um, that that um we started off you know not knowing if it was going to work or not mm -hmm. and so we're, we're now i think we're like three years going strong it's a lot of time to produce podcasts most don't make it that far uh-uh you're uh, right uh, well speaking of longevity what what would you if you were to kind of paint a picture of the future of the discovery park what would you be looking at yeah you know um i think that um it's time for me to do a new three-year strategic plan Mm -hmm. uh, for Discovery Park, and so we're um, we're looking at that. Um, obviously, uh, with well, not obviously. If you haven't been here, um, you wouldn't realize that we have 50 acres, and so we have um, enough 
we have enough here for people to literally spend three days doing. So we don't want to necessarily expand outwards and add a thousand different things. We want to vary um, with a lot of strategy, enhance and improve uh, the experience and make it, you know, we have, t we have traveling exhibits that come um, every year. And so we want to make sure the quality of those stays uh, significant. During uh, COVID, a lot of companies that develop traveling exhibits put, put everything on hold. So uh, the American Association of Museums Conference is coming up in a couple of weeks. And so we're going to go to that and try to find some really fantastic uh, bodies and Titanic level uh, exhibits that we can bring in in 2025. Uh, so, I mean, I think it's just continuing what we've learned and building upon that, um, making sure that we're here uh, for for uh, the people of this region mm -hmm. to, to bring their kids. And, you know, we have, um, I joked the other day, we, um, we have had a lot of people who met here and then they had their wedding here and then they have their kids' first birthday parties here. And so I joked that maybe we need to have a cemetery so that we could literally be cradles to grave here at Discovery Park. So, yeah. you know, we want to continue this great relationship we have with the people of this yeah. region, you know, continue to serve. Well, Halloween would be a lot easier than two, you know, <laughs> play off each other really nicely. Well, Scott, I want to appreciate, I want to say thank you for your time. Appreciate you coming on and appreciate what you're doing at the discovery park it's a it's it should be an anchor of west tennessee for years to come and and leadership is going to be required for it to do that so appreciate what you're doing up there and um uh, you know if you guys are interested in discovery park where should they go to find out more discoveryparkofamerica.com and then go buy a ticket and yeah, absolutely and you know what I, i'm up there all the time i'd love to say hello so ask for scott williams and i'll give you the little the little welcome spiel so all right well thank you scott and we'll uh, talk to you later